Elsie, thank you so much. I'm Ravina, and I'm going to do the introduction here. Um, what we're going to be speaking about tonight is essentially how to recognize and attract the good bugs to your garden and what to do if you find the bad ones and what and particularly what to do if you find the truly ugly buglies. So again, Gina um, uh, is with me this evening, as is Hillary, and we're going to start out by involving the audience because you have some bugs on your screen right now. And starting with the upper left-hand picture, does anyone know what that bug is and if it is a good bug to have or a bad bug to have? Anybody just jump in there. Ladybug. And is it a good one or a bad one? Good. It's a good one. Um, ladybugs like to eat bad bugs. Um, they are vociferous eaters. However, they're not particularly selective. So they might just eat the good bugs along with the bad bugs. The next one on the right, upper right-hand corner, um, anyone wanna identify that one? Flying bug in the right-hand upper corner. It's a paper wasp. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this uh, insect a little later on. Um, but it is a good bug, um, somewhat. Um, it eats, uh, like, it's a pollinator, obviously, and it will eat bad spiders and other insects. There's um, some folks in the middle there, um, and whoops. The I will go ahead and tell you that the bug's in the middle. That's a wire worm. Um, and you will not see them on top of the ground. You'll see them underneath the ground. Um, and that's the challenge um, because you can't see them, but they will eat holes in your carrots and in your potato tubers. So those are definitely bad guys to have. Those are the wire worms. And in the lower left-hand corner, um, you probably saw already that that's a good bug. That is a pirate bug. Um, and this bug eats small insects and mites. Um, so that's a good thing in your garden. And then finally, in the bottom right, I'm not going to jump ahead. So if you can tell me what the bottom right hand picture is, what kind of bug that is, and if it's a good one or a bad one, jump right in there. Just take a guess. Well, it's an earwig and it is actually a bad bug. It will eat your flowers and it will eat your veggies. So, and of course there are millions of insects in this world, um, but tonight we're going to talk about some that we have noticed, particularly in Cook County. Um, Hillary and Gina and I like to talk about ones that we have personally had to deal with in our own gardens. Um, so first of all, I'm gonna turn it over to Gina to talk a little bit about what steps you wanna take when you see bugs in your garden. Um, and then we'll start talking about the specific bugs that we have noticed and how we've dealt with them along the way. So Dean, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, and here are some, just for um, illustration here, um, we're, these are the ones we're gonna talk about. So we're gonna talk about the bad guys, the flea beetles, the Colorado potato beetles, cabbage loopers, blister beetles, cutworms and aphids. We're gonna talk about the good guys that we've seen in our gardens, soldier beetles, rove beetles, 
green lace wings. They are not highlighted. The last two high, are not highlighted in blue, native bees and Lepidoptera, which are their butterflies, but uh, you could have whole courses on those. Um, but we certainly need to mention them as good guys. And then finally, um, we are going to talk about the paper wasp, um, who is a true Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. We are going to talk about why. And then we will end with the truly ugly bugly, the slugs. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Gina. Hi, my name is Gina Meissner, and I get to talk to you about integrated pest management. And integrated pest management is an effective and environmentally conscious way to deal with pest problems in the garden. And I'm going to talk to you about the three main steps that have little mini steps under them on how to implement integrated pest management. Um, when I was doing the course to become a master gardener, integrated pest management seemed like such a huge word and even a huger and harder to discern topic. But when it is broken down, it is really basically based on common sense. And with that, um, what I'm talking about is you want to, first of all, know what you want to get rid of. Is it necessary to get rid of it? Is it going to harm the plant? Is it going to um, spread like wildfire and harm all my plants? Or is it going to stay isolated? Um, is it something that is going to, like in flowers, how fussy are you on how perfect that flower looks? Or is it all right to have one or two messy flowers in a whole stand? You know, when it comes to flowers, it's based more on aesthetics and what you're willing to tolerate. Whereas in the vegetable garden it be, it, and in your fruit, on your fruit trees and bushes, it becomes more of a food safety issue. Um, so you want to start with building your knowledge. You want to ID identify it. And with that, I will be sending out a resource page with links to the University of Minnesota Extension Service that has an excellent way to identify the pests that are causing the problem in your garden. And you can also use Nowadays, like iNaturalist has an, uh, is an excellent app that will help you um, identify the insect. And there's a few others that will be listed in that resource guide. So you'll want to know what is the life cycle of the pest, because if it's just starting out, maybe you don't have to worry about it as much as when it reaches an adult. Um, what is the behavior of this pest? Um, what are the population dynamics? Is it something that I just have to worry about in the spring and it's transient and then it goes away? Um, and what is the host plant life cycle? And you gotta remember that when we talk about pests, it can include insects, viral diseases, um, fungus, and things like that. Then your next step is to decide what you're going to do about it. Is it serious enough to intervene or can you just let nature take its course? Um, is the problem going to get worse or not? Is it going to harm the plant or is the plant going to recover? Is it worth treating? And then you have to make the, do I want to intervene? And like, we're going to talk later about um, the bugs that we have found in our own gardens. And a lot of them, you can just, they're not gonna harm the plant. They're just kind of sticky or look a little messy and stuff, but it's not gonna interfere, like aphids won't interfere with the health of the apple tree. The apples will grow just fine and all that, but it does leave a sticky residue. And if you don't like, 
brushing against it all the time and you know having to deal with getting rid of the aphids off your thing, you may want to um, treat it. And then when it comes to control tactics, you want to kind of um, see how far you want to go. Can, first of all, try to pick plant varieties that are kind of resistant to disease, viruses, et cetera. Um, pick the right plant for the right place. Don't try um, to grow something next to something else that where one plant will have a problem with infestation of a bug. Don't plant that next to another plant that might succumb to that infestation. Um, also <clears throat> think of physical barriers. Um, cabbage loopers, you may want to put remay or a tunnel cover over your broccoli and cabbages and stuff like that. Um, for cutworms, there's a physical remedy. Um, for other ones, there's, you can, um, it's common sense to remove the weeds to remove plant debris. And that if you think about where the insect likes to lay eggs, it's usually on something, under something, or just below ground. So if you take care and keep a clean garden, so there's no weeds growing right up next to your flowers or your vegetables, any um, dead leaves that fall down and that, if you clean that up, and just keep a neat, orderly flower bed, neat, orderly vegetable garden. Most of the time, you can even avoid the start of a problem with insects and disease. <clears throat> then there's also the attract, if you plant plants that attract um, a good bug that would eat on a bad bug, that's another way to take care of it. And then your final last resort should be chemical. And on this one, um, I would start out with maybe more of a natural, organic, biodegradable control before bringing in the big guns. And if you do decide to use the big guns, make sure you read the label implicitly, make sure you understand what it is saying and follow the instructions exactly. Next. Hang on. I'm sorry, I'm frozen up here. Sometimes that happens. Looking good now. All right. Let me keep going. Here we go. Sorry about that. Okay, and I will be sending in the resource document this link that will take you to what's wrong with my plant. And it goes, it will give you the option of um, what your plant looks like, what's ailing it, to choosing a insect, choosing a worm, choosing um, caterpillar. It really kind of helps it lists multiple choices that you can choose from In the next slide okay i pretty much touched on everything here but i just want to re-emphasize that in your your control tactics include cultural and again it's choosing the right plant for the right place and also a lot of the vegetables that um, you can now plant are done so that they are resistant to a lot of the um, diseases and fungus and viral things that are out there. Um, when you water, make sure you water early in the morning. Don't water in the heat of the day. Um, 
when you fertilize, fertilize judiciously, don't over fertilize. And then if you, when you're weeding and you're watering and you're going out almost every day to check on your garden, turn, turn over those leaves of your vegetable plants and stuff or your flowers and look to see if there's any bugs there and don't let them sneak up on you to begin with because it's easier to take care of them and you can pretty much manually take care of them if they're caught early enough. Again, for physical, use um, physical barriers such as row covers, garden fabrics, um, set up traps, um, and then removing weeds. The biological includes attracting other pests that are natural enemies to the one that you're trying to get rid of. And that would include um, planting um, mainly native plants that would attract the good bugs. And again, in the resource document that I'll be sending, there will be the link to that. And then um, as far as chemical, you know, use that as a last resort and try to use organic or um, the biodegradable ones versus the man-made pesticides. And then if you do use the man-made pesticides, I can't stress enough to read the label and follow the instructions implicitly. The other thing I'd like to mention is if you're going to, I know one of my favorite products to use is insecticidal soap. It takes care of a lot of the bugs that I don't particularly want on my vegetable plants or my flowers. And I do have a homemade recipe for it. And the homemade recipe I have is from um, Hausdorff and Orchids, and they have a huge greenhouse and ship orchids worldwide. So I trust his recipe implicitly. That being said, beware of homemade remedies for getting rid of bugs, because sometimes you end up getting rid of the plant as well. So make sure that whatever you use is more science-based than, um, oh, my grandma used this, or, or make sure it comes from a reliable source. And then I think it's on to somebody okay. else. All right. So we are going to uh, talk about some personal experiences here. I um, moved to Cook County uh, in 2018, and one of the first things I wanted to do was to plant things that I knew were going to take some time to get established. Um, for example, asparagus. I wanted a bed of asparagus knowing that it would take me about three years to ever harvest, and I wanted to start some fruit trees. And so here was one of my first apple trees. As you can see, it was in a field of greenery. It's actually on a south facing hill. Um, so it's pretty hard to get down there and clean that greenery up, but it is a great place to plant apple trees um, for all the obvious reasons. Um, here was my dream. I read all about apples in Minnesota. I know that we, grow them, uh, they grow very well in our climate. And so that was my vision. And this is what I got my first year. Um, this was, I went out and looked at this apple tree and all of my four apple trees, I found these little, they were dead flies on my apple leaves. And so I panicked, you know, and the first thing you want to do is, oh, my God, what do I need to spray? Right. And then I went to the uh, website that we're going to um, be giving you the materials on. And I found out that it was an entopathogenic fungi that actually it was what was happening. These flies were just passing through. They did no damage to my apple trees. I picked them off 
And um, they were simply using my tree as a host. Um, and they went, you know, they died or went on their merry way. So, but this is an example of things that can come around simply because you have this overgrown vegetation. So it's an illustration of what Gina was talking about. My hill looks much different now. And when you are able to control all of the weeds and get things cleared out, then you're going to have, you know, much more luck keeping, you know, unwanted down. So here are some of the other um, examples of bad things that each of us have found in our gardens here um, in Cook County. I'm gonna talk about the first three, um, flea beetles, potato leaf hoppers, and cabbage loopers um, are all things that I have found um, on my plants. So here's the story of the flea beetle. If you grow things like um, collards or cabbage, things that really like the, the weather up here, Brussels sprouts, they have a really long growing season. I haven't had much success with them, but kale, lettuce, radish, carrot tops, um, all of those, um, and particularly um, uh, the, the leafy vegetables, obviously. Um, you may have trouble with the flea beetles. And they are just like fleas that you would get on an animal. You go out there and they're just jumping around everywhere and you begin to panic. Um, and, you know, they ultimately can um, chew up your, your leaves. But these are some collards that had um, flea beetles on them and they were perfectly fine. They didn't affect the taste at all. Um, they weren't beautiful. I mean, you obviously wash them, the leaves off and so forth and cook um, the greens, but you know, they're a nuisance. I learned that relative to cabbage and, you know, broccoli, things of that nature, cauliflower, um, they're more prevalent on seedlings. The flea beetles are more prevalent on seedlings. Um, they like the cooler weather. And um, in addition to controlling them by um, keeping the weeds down, um, you can put the row covers on. But another thing I also learned in these resource materials that we're giving you is that the later that you can put these things out, the better, the warmer weather, they are more resistant to things like this. They grow faster and they're better able to resist than these seedlings getting started. Um, here is another pest in Cook County. This is the Colorado potato beetle. Um, and these guys are, um, you know, they they are best picked off um, using an approach that G Gina talked about in terms of hand picking them off, um, throwing them into a soapy bucket of water. Um, you can use neem oil. Uh, Gina talked about her favorite um, insecticide soap. I like to use for things because I grow, you know, the cabbage, the lettuce, the um the cauliflower and these are thing these are plants where you know you'll see these kinds of pests that I'm talking about and I like to use neem oil neem oil is a natural um uh, there's a neem tree and I think it grows in either a Asia or Africa or maybe both so it's a natural organic material you can get that um, I think I got mine online I also use BT, um, that's another organic um, uh, material that you can get at Bucks and mix it in a, in a um, uh, bottle following the directions carefully. Um, so those will take care of some of these critters. Um, with potatoes, um, you may want to consider picking some potatoes that are early maturing um, to avoid some of these pests or minimize the 
damage, you know, based on their life cycle. So early maturing potatoes, 80 days, let's say, or a little less than 80 days. Um, crop rotation is good for control. You may not want to grow potatoes every year or at least alternate your beds. These are all things that can help with controlling pests. And then finally, here's another guy um, that I've certainly experienced. These are um, cabbage loopers. I usually notice them, um, and this is their life cycle. You can see the eggs down on the bottom. And I think they're usually down on the bottom of the leaves, underneath side, I should say, of the leaves. Um, you can see when they end up in their looper stage up at the top. I usually notice them in the white butterflies. I'm like, oh, white butterflies, cabbage loopers are on the way. Um, so, um, you can um, use the soap, soapy water um, to uh, pick them off, get rid of them. Um, there are some natural predators that we will be talking about shortly when we talk about the good bugs. Um, but that is, uh, you know, as we said, the first step is to ID it. And this is the cabbage looper in its various stages. Um, so with that, I am going to pass it off to, who's got the next one? Oh, that would be Hillary. Yeah, the blister beetle. <laughs> um, my first encounter with blister beetles was last year. It was kind of like a horror film, actually. Um, I had gone out and I was growing potatoes and they were really pretty and flowering. And I went out in the morning and I came out in the afternoon to admire them. And it was like the invasion of the blister beetles. I had no idea what they were. There were like 75 to 100. They were in all my plants. And so the first thing I did was like, oh my gosh, it's the plagues. It's hitting here. And so then I did what we've really talked about because we may be master gardeners, which means that we're mastering learning, not mastering having answers. So I just want to make that really clear. And the first thing I did was took pictures of them. I went to the ID site and I'm curious, um, you can just throw it into your chat because I can't see hands, but if people would just take a second and then I'll stop for a minute. How many of you experienced blister beetles last year or have experienced them before? If you have, just put it into the chat, just say yes. I want to see. So far, I'm not seeing anybody. No one? No one has experienced blister beetles. Well, be grateful. Um, they hit many parts of Cook County last year. And the thing about them is that they are very um, voracious. They eat the uh, plant. They eat rapidly your plant. Oh, no experience, one says. Okay, well, that's fine. What, what triggered them, and it's really an interesting history about this, is drought drought and grasshoppers. So as many of you remember in 21, it was a very dry year. We had those forest fires around us. I mean, the sky and days were yellow here. And it was a very dry, dry summer. And the grasshoppers came. And blister beetles like grasshoppers. So they arrived last year. And other people were experiencing them as well. And the reason that they are called blister beetles is they don't bite, but they re release a very potential toxin. And you can see actually people having some kind of like contact dermatitis from these, these blister beetles. And on top of that, these blister beetles can get into alfalfa. And this is nothing to horse around with because these blister beetles can actually kill a horse. If there's so many in a uh, bale of hay, I know we're not dealing with hay tonight, but I think it's important to know that's, that's a, a really concern um, if you ever discover and you have friends who discover blister beetles in their alfalfa and their hay. Um, they have been known to kill and not many of them because of this toxin. So you say, well, 
what do you do with these? Um, and you find them. It's very common. Um, what we've talked about with other uh, pests is that number one, don't squish them. Okay. Don't handle them except with gloves because they don't, they're not aggressive. But if you mess with them, they release their toxin. I mean, you know, you have to defend your space. So they release this toxin. So what you should do is wear um, some kind of glove, hand pick them off and drop them into soapy water. What we did, they lasted here for close to three weeks, starting probably mid late June. And every morning and every afternoon went out and picked them off um, wearing gloves, dropping them into soapy water and eventually we got rid of them. But they're really, um, I don't think that they destroyed our potato plants, but I don't think you want them in the garden because if you're working in the garden and you brush up against them, they can be aggressive and release this toxin, which if you get it on, can create some nasty little skin burns. So I think um, welcome to the blister beetle. For all of you who have not experienced them, be grateful. But if they ever show up and they're pretty obvious, um, you'll know what, what to do with them. And uh, like I said, they were scattered throughout Cook County. And I know that um, Extension, we had a number of people saying, what are these things that have arrived in mass? Because they just come in, in hordes. So that's a little bit about the blister beetle. <clears throat> and something you would not want in your garden, nor do you want to handle, except with gloves. Okay. <clears throat> okay, Rowan. I know. Here we go. Froze up again. <laughs> okay. Cutworms, everybody's nightmare. Um, Cutworms are called cutworms because what they do is they, as in the picture, they cut down their love, which is tender young seedlings, and they cut them, they chew through the stem right at ground level and there goes your plant. Um, we up here in Minnesota have, I think it's five or six varieties of cutworms but they are basically the most active in the springtime. If you can get your plants through the springtime, um, generally that is, their feeding frenzy has pretty much come to an end. Um, they have very few hairs on them. They grow to about two inches in length. And um, believe it or not, the best way to deal with them is to prevent them getting to the stem. And what that entails is first of all, um, keeping the area weed free, pick up any debris and sift your hands through the first inch or two of soil up to a foot out around the plant and bring it up to the surface because a cutworm, when it comes to surface will make its characteristics characteristic C shape as shown in the middle photo there. Um, and then if you find them, get rid of them in soapy water. To prevent them from doing their damage in the first place, when you um, plant your seedlings, take a cardboard tube like a toilet paper roll or um, paper towel roll cut in half. And plant it and put the seedling into the tube, but make sure your cardboard tube goes about two, two and a half inches into the soil and about two, two and a half inches above the soil. That way the worm cannot um, access your stem of the plant. The um, cutworms come out in the evening and feed overnight. So when you're out going for a walk before going to bed or whatever, and you have that desire to see 
if you would have cutworms, they're easily spotted because they would be above ground and would be feasting on the stem. I personally um, don't want to feed the mosquitoes and the black flies, so I wait to see if I have any damage. Um, so far, I've only had a um, couple of potato plants when they came up. I found what had come up had toppled over and that. So then I just made collars that went underground and above ground for the rest of the potato plants. Um, and then once the potato plants got large enough, it was a non-issue because um, the cutworms really only like the tender young seedlings that you plant. So if you can get them through the spring, you're pretty much done. And actually, from, from my experience and talking with other gardeners, it's it's really easy to just clean, keep a clean um, area around your plants and then just check every day or two to see if you have any damage, like in the pictures. Okay, next slide. Aphids. This is my, um, this was, is my crab apple tree in the left corner and then the leaves demonstrating the honeydew that the aphids secrete. Aphids are about a 16 to an eighth of an inch long and they're readily identifiable because they got tailpipes or cornicles coming out of their rear end. If, as you can see in the bottom right-hand picture, those two straight black lines. So twin tailpipe, it's an aphid. The other tail, telltale sign is um, in the sunlight, you'll see a shimmery, shimmeriness on the leaves. And that is like in the middle picture, that's the honeydew that they secrete. And it's a very sticky substance, really high in sugar that ants love to feed on and yellow jackets specifically in the um, late summer, early fall. Aphids are a problem, believe it or not, in years, in drought years or years where there's a, late, a light rainfall and no heavy downpours. Aphids can not, they're weaklings, they're wusses. They really don't fly per se. Although um, there's one variety that produces a winged aphid that can fly if it jumps and the wind comes from the right direction and it can fly off. But um, generally they're stationary. Where was I going with this? So if you have heavy, habitually heavy rains like every two, three weeks, that heavy rain is enough force to force the aphids off of whatever they're on. And to imitate that, you can just use your hose on a strong spray setting and just spritz them off just like that. And it works. Aphids will not kill a plant, will not harm it, will not have any long-term ill effects. Um, it's usually more a cosmetic thing, or for me, I just don't like brushing against the honeydew because then my arm is sticky. And then if I go weeding or something and I brush against a dandelion head, then I've got that fuzz on my arm. It's just a mess. So I tend to, if it's a bigger area, I will take my garden hose on a strong spray setting and just hose them off. Another thing that works really well, if you have a larger infestation and you don't want to hose them off and you just don't really, you can't stand to do nothing, insect, insecticidal soap works wonders for them. Um, sometimes the honeydew that they produce um, can cause a what is called a sooty mold to develop, which is a blackish mold on the leaves. It has absolutely no harmful effect on the plant or on the tree, and it can be ignored. Um, 
where honeydew becomes more of a problem is like, let's say I park my car underneath an apple tree that has a lot of aphids and the honeydew drips down onto my car. Yeesh. The way to get rid of that is to use like um, Dawn dish detergent and scrub or use a tar, believe it or not, you'll have to use a tar remover to get it off. That's how, how strong and thick this honeydew can become. Um, what else did I want to say? The best way to prevent it again is to keep a clean garden, to remove weeds, plant debris, and um, make sure that there's air circulation and stuff. I have had for in my pal, that's one other thing I wanted to say is if you plant like in your flower beds and stuff, if you plant native plants, those native plants will attract mainly good bugs versus bad bugs. And then those good bugs will help get rid of the bad bugs in your vegetable garden, just a thought. Um, because I have not found any bad bugs in my pollinator garden, but and but I have found the bad bugs in my vegetable garden or on my fruit trees. And the aphids just seem to love crab apple and apple trees for some reason. And I think that covers it. Oh, and if you um, let this aphids get ignore it and do nothing, eventually they'll suck all the juice out of the leaves and the leaves will curl, curl up and turn yellow and any new growth will become stunted. And um, it doesn't cause any permanent damage by next spring, you, you won't even be able to tell where the aphids were. And that wraps up my talk. Rovina? All right. Well, we're going to go on to the good. And who's going to talk with us about lace wings? I am going to talk to you. All right. Now that we've had kind of the nightmares of these creeping, crawling things, enter the green lace wings. And they're really pretty. There's actually two kinds, brown and green. But I think most of us up here see the green. Um, they're very about three quarters of an inch long. Um, they have these beautiful net-like wings, and they have, it's really hard to see, but they, they really have golden eyes, so they're very pretty. And the larva is often attached to a long stem, and they're in the summer months um, because they love aphids. So, a matter of fact, these, one of the things that I learned about green lace wings and you can see their little eggs in the top left corner, is that you can, they are so um, beneficial that they actually, you can buy them commercially. So I know that some people order, uh, you know, ladybugs, but you can buy green lace wings commercially. And in the summer months, it's really the, um, the larva that loves things like aphids, they like leaf hoppers, mites, eggs of pest insects. So these are really, really beautiful. And not only are they beautiful, but they're beneficial. So that's a little bit about the green lace wigs and why that um, why they're so why they're cultivated and grown uh, to sell commercially because they are just this wonderful. Um, all those little bad bugs that you just saw, that's a delicious meal for them. And one of the things that we talk about is how can you do this naturally? And this is a great example uh, of having them. I don't know how many of you have ever seen these pretty green lace wigs. You know, I think part of the challenge why we're spending a little time is that when the word bug comes up, we automatically put this adjective B-A-D, bad. And so I'm here to tell you that there are another adjective called G-O-O-D, good. And so please don't kill everything in your garden just because it's a bug. 
And if you've seen one of these, um, you can appreciate how pretty they are. And when you see them, you can shout. And if you don't have them, you can always get them commercially from a variety of sources. Okay, next one. All right, hang on. I'm not going there to- There you go. <laughs> Rove beetles. All right. um, Rove beetles are often black or brown. They have very short little wings. Their abdomen is pretty much exposed. And of course, where do you find them? You find them on the ground under stones and leaves and in loose soil in the spring. And I know they look ugly, okay? And they look like something you'd like to kill, but take a few seconds to look at them. Look at their short little wings. Look at their structure. They eat a variety of predators of other insects. So they might be ugly. And when you're lifting up your leaves, looking for other kinds of stuff, please remember that these do not kill these. If you see them, do not kill them. Okay, that's my rove beetle. Probably the one more people have seen are the soldier beetles. Um, how many of you, just out of curiosity, have seen these in your garden? You can just put a little piece in the chat. I'll wait for a minute. Have you seen these in your garden? I don't know what people have in their gardens. I haven't seen these. Maybe nobody's looking in their gardens yet. Maybe. From last year, do you have any memories? We've got, we've got no experience and no so far. Okay. Well, these are very pretty, and I have these in my garden. And you often see these. They're about three-eighths to about half-inch long. Um, they've got these black spots. They're often called um, golden soldier beetles as well. They're in the summer, late July, September. They like yellow plants as well. And they, the larva, again, the adults are pollinators, okay? So these are a double function. The adults are pollinators and the larva eat um, small kill, caterpillar, caterpillars, uh, some bad beetles, they eat grasshoppers, eat all kinds of stuff. And they're called soldier beetles because they soldier on and they kill the things that you don't want in your garden, okay? <laughs> all right. Um, one of the things, and you're gonna get this tomorrow, but I think it's really important um, <clears throat> to take a look at that. These are the beneficial insects. I would like you to know them. And that um, the prayer host, so that the eggs are laid on lawn stalks attached to plants, as I talked about with the green um, lace wings. And they eat aphids, beetle larvae, caterpillars, eggs of pests. Um, they eat leaf hoppers. They eat um, mites. And they eat all kinds of things that you don't want in your garden. And so one of the things, and we're also going to talk a little bit about what paper wasps tonight. Um, I know Ravina is going to talk about that. But these are really helpful for you to, to know what it is in your garden that they will eat. Because when you talk about integrated pest management, that big word, what it means is how can I really control the problem pests in my garden. And the easiest way to do it is to um, enhance the habitat with flowering plants that are native that will bring in beneficial insects that provide um, both uh, insect population control and pollination. And I know you're probably gonna get tired of myself and Rovina and Gina um, saying the same things, but if we keep repeating it about keeping your garden clean, um, about the value of beneficial insect and their double function of both pollinators and insects and how you bring them in. Um, you can really begin to enjoy uh, your gardens with less disruption from your problematic pests. Okay, Rovina. All right, so looking at the uh, final entry here on this um, chart, you'll see paper wasps as Hillary mentioned. And thinking back to some of the pictures we showed you of the pests, uh, the cabbage looper was one um, that preys on cabbage and brassicia. I'm not saying that proper, but 
um, those that that genus of plants, whether it's the cauliflower, the broccoli, um, the cabbage, the the, the collards, etc. And so let's talk a minute about the paper wasp. Um, he, from my perspective, is a true Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I personally have problems with the Mr. Hyde part of it because I only see a Dr. Jekyll here. This is um, a picture of their nests. Um, they like um, eaves of garages. They like eaves of houses. They like, I had the biggest nest I ever saw um, underneath, um, hidden back behind a covered uh, grill um, in the corner of my deck. And they liked the cedar um, deck material and they, you know, build their nest underneath it. Um, and so that was about the size of the nest um, that I found last year. Um, here is a picture of them doing their good work. They're pollinating um, and certainly they're eating of other pests. But one thing you should know about the paper wasp in Cook County um, and I learned this from the emergency room doctor, um, is that they're aggressive. If you in any way, shape or form um, upset them, get in their space. Um, I have actually been stung twice on two in two separate years. And the more you get stung, if you're highly allergic, the worse the reactions get. Um, so I garden with EpiPens now um, and watch out for the paper wasp because I don't want them. Um, they, um, the first experience I had with them was just sitting on the deck and we saw them, but they just attacked um, without disruption. I guess we were just sitting in their space. And the second time, you know, they gave me plenty of warning. They buzzed me a few times. I thought it was a, I thought it was a fly, a horse fly, um, until they stung or one of them stung. So in any event, um, it's a true Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but um, in Cook County, um, they do like the county. They are prolific. And there are some people that are very allergic to them because I was not the only one that my particular emergency room doctor had seen um, last summer. Um, so they can be kind of nasty. All right, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Hillary for drum roll, the truly ugly bugly. The truly ugly bugly, meet the slug. I'm sure all of you have seen a slug. There it is. I mean, that's, isn't that really kind of gross? It's a snail without a shell. Um, and go back. I want to, I want to talk about this. Okay. Wait a minute. You got excited. No I, one wants to look I, at it. I don't know. Okay. So, I mean, you know, they've got their characteristics, little antennas. They're slimy. They... Um, you check for them under the garden, in the garden, and they are found under plants where it's shady, cool, and they're protected. Um, I've had them in my garden one year when it was really a damp year. Um, you can go ahead to the next one. Um, one way to deal with them is planting in rows or that are more narrow, but the soil, if the soil is constantly wet, you can even amend your soil with uh, compost. Um, if you have um, in your garden that there's a way to make sure that the leaves aren't close to the ground, you can prune the leaves. And like we talked about before, water in the morning. Um, avoid over watering in the afternoon. Don't water the leaves. Don't water uh, the flowers. Um, these things, these ugly buglies, love moist damp things. Um, I know one year when it was really wet, I found them under the leaves by my green bean plant. And they're really very gross. Um, they 
plant for drier conditions. They hate full sun. They're kind of like vampires. They don't like full sun. They live where it's dark. They often come out at night. Um, and you can also, the certain plants that they just don't like, they don't like milkweed. Um, and there's a whole list of plants that slugs do not like, but I'm sure most of us have had them. So you say, well, what happens when you find them? Well, okay, what have we talked about before with everyone? The first thing you do is you can hand pick them and drown them in soapy water. I just have visions of our gardens all having these little buckets of soapy water. And then you can lay out, um, if you really want to attract them and then draw them out, which is one way to deal with them, you lay out some flat board or new, a damp newspaper and you put them out and slugs love the night. And so they come out at night and they'll crawl underneath them. And then you lift them up in the morning and there are your ugly slugs. And again, you can hand pick them and throw them. Now, if gardening has driven you to distraction and you find yourself drinking beer, uh, beer traps, and I didn't say bear, I said beer traps, um, it's good for what ails you, so to speak, um, are really uh, a way, uh, a natural way to actually deal with them. And it's listed not as grandma's story, but by the University of Minnesota, you bury a container into the ground. So the top of the container is level with the ground and you pour the beer in six, seven inches deep. What you wanna always leave is about one inch below the top and slugs are attracted to beer. I can't tell you why. They don't have a favorite brand that I've ever seen. So buy the cheapest beer you can buy and they go out, they go into the beer and they drown. Um, I shouldn't be so excited about that, but they do. Um, and the other thing is, is that a natural predator that I talked about before were rove and soldier beetles. Um, so there are really some natural ways that you can do this. Keep your garden clean. When you find them, you can um, try different ways, such as your beer trap. If you don't have beer, there's a mixture you can do with yeast, which will bring in uh, the same kind of element as beer does. Uh, and if all else fails, as we walk through integrated pest management, there are sometimes some products I know Buck has carried, Bucks has carried some, um, but there are some chemicals. Um, iron phosphate is one, <clears throat> and you can sprinkle it around the plant. It's effective for about two weeks. But anything that you can do to avoid having slugs in your garden. Again, you know, um, clean up the debris, clean up the wet spots. I always know that when I finish my garden in the fall, I rake it out, make sure that my ground is as clean as I can get it and um, take away any of the habitat that they really like. So those are some ways to deal with the truly ugly bugs. We, as the three of us decided these were the most ugly of all the buglies, maybe you disagree. But I think that gives you an overview of some ways to begin to deal with the bad bugs, um, the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde wasp, and, and our good friends. And I think now we probably want to move into the next slide, which would be some questions and times in our well, hands. On that note, Hillary, somebody commented about soft flies. Any comments about soft flies? I haven't had much experience with them. I don't know, Gina or Rovina, have you had experience with soft? I have not. Gina, have you? You're muted. There you go. Yep. Um, very little, and it was about 30 years ago, and I've not had any trouble since then. Um, who is the person who asked? You want to unmute yourself and ask more questions with it, you can. Otherwise, you can stay anonymous if you'd like as well. So, nope, sorry about that. that was me, Jennifer. Okay, Jennifer, if you want to, I'm going to put my email address in the chat. And if you want to email me, also softflies, I will do some research and get the information and 
um, send you what I find tomorrow. Does that work? Yeah, yeah. They were actually, they, they, it was like a plague. And they were on my, I have a mountain ash. That and they, was where I had mine. Oh, yeah. They just devoured every leaf. They um, were everywhere. It was really gross. <laughs> this is Kathy. Um, and I had a lot of problem with saw flies. And I just put in the chat what I used. And I got that powder, that diatome, whatever it is, made oh. of diatomes. And I put it around the base of oh, saw flies. I what I read is the saw flies lay their eggs in the ground. And then those, um, the larva, after the eggs hatch, the larva move up into your plant or tree or whatever it is. And um, if you put this powder underneath your, your tree or your plant, and make it kind of thick. I do it in the fall and I do it in the spring. I haven't seen them. Thanks. That's interesting. Yeah, it really worked wonderfully. Um, I, I, I saw the question about slugs and eggshells. Um, you know, when we talk about the dimitaceous earth, um, which is also another way of breaking things up, um, it's not recommended, quite frankly, in the materials that I have read from the university and other sources. I don't see eggshells listed as much. I see much more about um, the hand picking, about the beer or using a yeast type of trap rather than, than eggshells. And I can't tell you why, but that's what I have seen in most of the research about that. It's like they also don't recommend that. Um, the, the dimitaceous, I never say that right, earth, um, even though those are, you know, a way to break up as well. Um, they don't recommend that for slugs. It's not as effective as people would think. Oh, and something else to keep in mind, people, when you, um, and I, I'm going to amend the resource guide, when you um, do research on stuff, um, Pretty much everything I've included is from the University of Minnesota Extension because we live in Minnesota, but there is nothing, absolutely nothing wrong um, when you want information on a topic, gardening question or that, because I am I certainly have done it, is to uh, put your question into Google and then add EXT at the end of your question. And what will happen is you'll get extension services from around the country as a resource to your question. And it's interesting how different states um, respond to different issues and stuff. And you can glean some really cool information because things, you know, with warmer temps, cooler temps, more rain, more snow and all that, um, bugs, pests, diseases, and stuff aren't stable. They they wax and wane, and new stuff is always popping into the county, like with the, the large borer on your tamaracks now is going to become a, a problem. Uh, emerald ash borer will eventually become a problem. So just keep that in mind, you know, to put EXT after a question, and you'll get more resources that way. Does anyone else have any questions or comments or something to ask or talk about? I got a question about um, the recordings that we have mentioned earlier. Those are on our website. And if you checked the email I sent you um, as a intro to coming tonight, um, that was in that email. Some specific ones I thought might be of interest, such as like composting or um, how to be uh, using soil amendments with your dirt, sort of things like that. Um, should be in your email already, but otherwise you can go to our website and go under the events tab, look for the recorded button and, or just give me a call. Happy to talk with you. So far, no other questions are popping up. So I would say 
think about unmuting yourself, share some more questions with us. We want to help you and you specifically with your needs as well as everybody else here. Um, if you have that question, I bet somebody else in the group has that question too. gets so quiet. It's just like the teacher pause where you have to wait long enough for them to all feel the pressure. <laughs> Can I ask a question? It's not exactly a pest question. It's more like an ID. And I'm just wondering if it's beneficial. I assume it's probably a beneficial insect, but um, I haven't seen much out yet, but I've seen these. They're like really large bumblebees with like kind of almost a reddish brown back. Has anybody seen those or know what those are? I just saw somebody post pictures of that on Facebook the other day. Uh -huh. And the bee lab answered, and I can't remember what the answer was, but it was a bumblebee of some sort. Yeah, um, I just had two today. They're huge. And um, What's really interesting is that my daffodils are blooming and they went off to the daffodils and had a little snack. And then both of them went to sleep in the midst of my daffodil. So <laughs> um, I, I was looking at that and just watching and thinking, you know, it is cool today, and um, but they're giant. I mean, they're- Yeah, they're, huge. Yeah, they're huge. And they're, I had two of them today and they went off to the daffodils and then they- had a nice time in the daffodils and then they went to sleep and then they got out later. So, <laughs> Sounds um, like having their best life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what, what the buzz is about that, but um, maybe you could, we could find that out for you too. And Gina, if you can find where you saw that, that would be helpful. Yeah. I'm making a note. There's also a couple other master gardeners on today with us. And I don't know if either, I won't put you on the spot, but, and I won't name you offhand, but if either one of you have anything to throw in about these large bumblebees that are buzzing around right now. So I've got I haven't had any, um, seen any bees, but I have very few things flowering right now at my house because it's a little cooler by the lake so that's I have some um, spring bulbs that are flowering but I haven't found any bees or anything as I've been looking and just a reminder to people and you've probably heard this in the pollinator classes we've offered do not right now take off Leave, leave your garden resting so the ground bees are happy and everything else. It's rather cool out there. Yeah, you're supposed to technically wait until the nighttime temperature is above 50, which might be a long wait this year. <laughs> oh, just kidding. Maybe not so much inland. That's probably warming up for you, inland. <laughs> yeah, I've had a couple of nights over 50, but then I also... Right, right. Had really cold like last night. Usually I, I try to wait until the end of May. And even the stalks that have broken off, I, I as I'm trying to do a little bit of cleanup, I do move them and put them in a pile that's just a refuse pile for, for bugs and things to hang out in. So because there might be nesting bees in there. Um, yeah, I just bundle up the broken um, stems and tie them with pieces of rope and hang them in a tree and let them do their thing. Mm. But otherwise, you know, 10 to 14 inches, if you can leave enough, the hollow stemmed, uh, stems that are attached to the plant, that's a good safe place for your bees, the nesting bees to stay until it gets warmer. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, you guys. Really nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have to tell you, Sally has a great presentation if you want to go watch one of hers too. Thanks, Kelsey. Absolutely.
Well, y'all, I would say we're sometimes done early. I want to encourage you to hang out if you have one-on-one -on -one questions or if you'd love to have a little bit more banter, but I also want to give the gift of time to those that maybe um, want to just enjoy the last bit of light before the night uh, ends and darkness kind of takes us all in for the night. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Hillary, Ravina, and Kina. That's been wonderful learning from you.